Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, online uh, event. My name is Josh McAllister and I'm the chair of the Independent Review of Children's Social Care in England. And the review has been running for um, just over six months now. We're about halfway through the review process. And back in June, we published our first document, which was the case for change. And in that document, we set out a number of problems and issues within the children's social care system. And one of the issues that we highlighted was that kinship care hadn't up until now been given the attention that it needs. Uh, and we have in that document urged the government to give kinship care the same level of focused leadership and attention that adoption has been given over recent years. So it's great to have this event um, being held um, today uh, at the end of Kinship Care Week. Um, and we've got a great panel um, who will be sharing some reflections with you and also able to answer some questions and hopefully get into some discussion as well. Um, the uh, administration for the session is really straightforward. I'm sure lots of people are now familiar with um, Zoom, but we're going to be using the Q&A function, which is a button at the bottom uh, of your screen, probably bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Um, and you can start adding questions in at any time. I can see people have already started to add some in, which is great. Um, and we'll be um, reviewing those, keeping an eye on them. And as I'm going through chairing the session, we'll make sure that we give, um, give as much time as possible to ask the panel those questions. So please do add into that as we go along. Um, but before we kick off, I just want to hand over to Lucy Peake, the Chief Executive of Kinship, to say a few words. Thanks, Josh. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this event in Kinship Care Week. We are this week showing our gratitude to the amazing kinship carers who are raising around 200,000 children in loving, supportive and permanent homes. And of course, it shouldn't be that kinship carers only feel our appreciation in a dedicated week. They should feel recognised and supported every day because they play an enormously significant role in caring for children who would otherwise often be in the care system. And keeping children within their family network re maintains relationships, promotes stability and a sense of permanence. And these factors lead to better outcomes in education, employment, mental health and relationships. It really does make sense to invest in well-supported kinship care. But too many kinship carers will recognise the phrase dump and run that was used by a kinship carer this week on BBC Five Live. It's an all too common experience. Instead of putting our arms around grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, and friends who literally drop everything, often at no notice to step up and do the right thing at huge personal cost, we're letting them down with woefully inadequate support. The system is riven with inequality. Instead of basing support on children's needs, it's rationed by legal order. We're denying children in kinship care the support that children who are fostered or adopted rightly receive. And in doing so, we're putting kinship carers in stressful and precarious situations, and we're putting children's outcomes at risk. The findings of our annual survey of kinship carers were published last week, and again show that practically, emotionally, and financially, we are not giving kinship carers a fair chance of success in supporting children to do well in life. 70% of, of carers feel they're not receiving the support they need from their local authority. And 62% believe their children have long-term health needs, but because they don't have health assessments like other children in care, they're not getting the support they need. And 39% of kinship carers who we know are likely to be older, in poorer health, more likely to be insecurely housed, socially isolated and living in poverty compared to other groups raising children, say they have their own additional needs that require more support than they are receiving. So bringing up someone else's child is a huge life-changing responsibility. And too often we're placing kinship carers under huge stress. This is risking placements falling apart and children ending up in costly state care. So it's fantastic that Josh and the review team have recognised kinship care as a huge national resource, 
but it is now critical that we take this opportunity to develop the thinking on how we can design a better system to support this unique form of care. It needs to be brimming with all the things that we know help children to thrive, love, stability, permanence, but which doesn't negate the need for a range of other support, financial allowances, access to therapeutic support, peer support for carers, paid time off work like a doctor's get, I could go on. We recognize this kind of support is necessary for children in other types of care, and it's time to level up to give kinship families the support that they deserve. We know it's possible because we're working with local authorities like Leeds, who you'll hear from later, who are investing in kinship care support and delivering positive outcomes for kinship carers and children. We need to learn from that good practice and bring national leadership and investment to accelerate progress. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone's perspectives and what the system should look like in today's discussion. And just remind you to please put your questions or comments into the, um, the chat box and I will make sure that they get to Josh and the panel later. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Um, the, the question that we're asking at this event is why is kinship care not recognised as the national resource that it is? And to start off with that discussion, um, who better to go to than a kinship carer? Um, Janet Kay, who is also an expert by experience board member for the review um, and is um, kinship carer to her grandson. So Janet, over to you. Oh, thank you, Josh. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm I would like to say it's lovely to meet you, but I can't actually see you all. But anyway, it's great that you're here. Um, why is kinship care overlooked in the way that other forms of care aren't? And I think one of the reasons for this is that um, it's uh, there's, there's been a lack of sort of um, real thought and regulation about the way that kinship care has increasingly been used as a way to, um, you know, find permanent homes for children in the last you know, a few years that, in fact, many children come into kinship care on different sorts of legal orders. Um, and for some, there's um, no, you know, necessary, uh, you know, rhyme or reason why they should have that particular order. Uh, I know families where they've been told the child cannot possibly live with the mother, but they still don't get a special guardianship order. Um, so I think there's, there's this sort of been this higgledy piggledy legal situation. Plus, there's also been a big growth in using use of kinship care. I mean, the law said for a long time that social workers should look for family care when they can. Um, but I think, you know, and this sounds rather cynical, but I think some of you may agree with me that one of the reasons why kinship care has grown is that it's very cheap to local authorities. It doesn't cost anywhere near as much as putting children in to foster care because the, um, as Lucy said, it dump and run mentality is not everywhere, but it's certainly in a lot of places so that um, children can end up um, being placed and um, support ends on that day, you know, as regards uh, the family. And this can be really distressing for some families and as they struggle to cope with major life changes. I mean, you know, people give up jobs, they give up plans, they give up, um, you know, um, I mean, I, I know people whose relationships are broken down because they take on kinship care, they've moved, had to move house. Um, everything about life can actually change when you become a kinship carer, as, as you well know. Um, but uh, often the, the sport isn't there to, um, to ride out these changes or, you know, deal with financial implications or deal with, emotional implications of uh, kinship care so I, I I do believe that you know it's been it's in a way kinship care has grown and and there's a form of care for children I think it's very positive children stay in the family they're just in another position in the family they stay with their identity with their roots with the people that they know they don't have the huge traumatic losses that children going into adoption have where they're cut off um, from family very sharply, they um, um, have, a, you know, often better outcomes than children who go into foster care. And it's an immensely um, positive form of care. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why it's grown so much. But, um, you know, think what we could do if we got the support we needed. It could be, a, you know, um, 
the outcomes could be tremendous. And um, so, you know, on this review, we're hoping to look at kinship care um, as a really sort of significant way forward for many children who come into the care system. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, the next um, panel member is Sir James Mumby, um, who uh, is now a retired High Court judge and is the former president of the Family Division for England and Wales. Um, the, the key word there is retired in the sense that Sir James is now more freely able to speak his mind. So looking forward to hearing um, what, what James has got to say about this topic. Well, can I begin by saying I agree with every single word Janet has just said. And in a sense, she said it all. But can I add two points? I think there are two points here. Uh, one is that for most of the last two decades, at least, the rhetoric and the focus has been on adoption as the ideal solution. Um, the other problem has been that kinship care has become tangled up with the particular problems of special guardianship orders. As Janet pointed out, there are many different legal frameworks which apply to kinship carers, but one of them is special guardianship. And special guardianship, when it was introduced about 15 years ago, was seen as a, a special solution uh, for probably a rather limited group of children and families for whom adoption, for one reason or another, wasn't available or wasn't appropriate. Uh, and in recent years, we've taken a completely different view as to both the paramountcy of adoption and as the availability and utility of special guardianship. Uh, and uh, it's common ground, I think, that a big impact on all this were the decisions of the House of the Supreme Court in 2013 in a case called Re B. And although I said myself, my own decision with colleagues in the Court of Appeal the same year in Re BS. And that has uh, focused on other solutions uh, where children need long-term care. Um, it has undoubtedly fostered the increase, which Jan has already referred to, in kinship care in recent years as being a solution. The problem is uh, that um, special guardianship um, is uh, not at present regulated by rules or procedures which are apt uh, for its current use it was moored in this concept 15 years ago of a rather specialist kind of private law order. And it is now increasingly used in care cases, perfectly properly, where the procedures are not entirely appropriate. Um, and the consequence of all this is that kinship care has, been, has become on the ground uh, an increasingly important uh, resource, uh, an increasingly important recourse, and a very, very important one, beneficial uh, to children, uh, but without uh, either the rhetorical underpinnings um, or some of the administrative uh, and legal underpinnings which one would like. And I think if I may say so, uh, just to finish, Jan was absolutely right to draw attention to the legal fragmentation in terms of the different types of legal order or sometimes no order at all, um, which underpin kinship care. So the consequence is that in a sense, adoption means something which lawyers can define, it's referred to in legislation, it's referred to in guidance, so is foster care. Kinship care doesn't, as a concept, have the same legal definition, uh, doesn't have the same definition in terms of uh, guidance, which the others have, and therefore it tends to be overlooked. Thanks very much, James. And finally, to Sal Tarek, who is the Director of Children and Families at Leeds City Council. Leeds, uh, as many of you will know, um, is at the forefront of services in England in supporting kinship care in a, in a meaningful and significant way. So it's great to have Sal here to share his thoughts too. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Josh, and, um, and, and thanks everybody for coming to um, this, this uh, event. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little, I mean, I agree uh, again with what's um, already been uh, said um, quite powerfully by Jenna particularly. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we might um, put more focus on uh, kinship care um, as a route forward and the way that we've tried to do that um, in Leeds, uh, particularly over the uh, last decade. 
Um, you may have heard that one of our ambitions is to be a child friendly city. And um, we focus a lot of attention on putting the child at the center of everything that we do. Um, but we do that really importantly within the context of their own family, uh, friendship and community network. Um, we use um, something called family group conferencing um, as early as possible um, in our work with families, which engages uh, the broadest um, family that we can in working in, in our work uh, from an early point. Um, so actually a lot of our focus is on um, supporting families to keep children within their uh, broader family and community network and not get anywhere near um, um, state care or um, care proceedings where, where possible. Um, once you're into that field, um, obviously the legislation says um, that um, families should be the first placement choice and the first place that you look for children to be. Um, and I just wonder whether, um, how hard do we look um, in terms of family and what the processes that we use around family group conference allow us to do is from an early point on try and have the work that we do led by families, uh, widen the circle of involvement from the family around the child. And I know there are uh, a number of challenges around that where people will say um, there are barriers to this because um, parents will say we don't want um, wider family involved. And I think there's a big question there um, about um, the rights of the child to their family and extended network. Uh, you know, if you listen to what Janet said about what positives kinship care brings in terms of um, children's identity, their esteem, their sense of belonging, their knowledge of their history, all of those, those things are rights for that child. And if we think about it in that way, then maybe we would put far more effort into widening that circle, making sure that we are um, placing children within uh, that loving and connected um, uh, the network that, that exists uh, that exists for that for that child. So, you know, we put a lot of resource, you know, people will talk about resource, we put a lot of resource and money into um, legal proceedings. They cost a lot of money. Um, we put a lot of resource and uh, energy into um, finding um, and supporting foster carers. We spend a lot of money in terms of um, building and running children's homes. Um, and um, if we if we were to shift um, some of the work that we do, some of that support and that help uh, into supporting kinship um, kinship care, um, I don't think that it, overall it will cost that much more. I think the issue, uh, and you'll have better outcomes for children, more children growing up within their within their families. So I think um, what we've tried to do in Leeds is to make that shift towards being very um, um, family led, uh, making sure that we are exploring all options possible. Um, and I think it also, one, one other thing I'll say is it takes a different skill set, I think, um, in terms of um, the uh, people that work uh, in this way. So you need um, good negotiation skills, um, family finding skills, you've got to be able to deal with conflict resolution. You know, culturally responsive, working with large groups, being really inclusive in terms of your decision making. And I think that some of that is a bit of a different skill set um, than uh, more traditional approaches um, uh, to, uh, to social work. So, 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 you know, ultimately, there's got to be a shift in the narrative. This is um, the most underutilized utility of the 21st century. Um, and it's a right for children, it's a right for them and it's a responsibility for families and communities to bring up their own children. So I think that's the balance that we want to strike here. The right of the child to their family and the responsibility of the family to bring up their child. Brilliantly put. Thank you very much, Sal. And I'll ask a few questions to the panel before um, bring Lucy back in to share some reflections on what's been coming into the, the, the chat function. But Sal, do you think that on that last point you made there about the um the skill that's needed to do the work and the question that you posed which was how hard are we looking are there other things that you think are holding us back as a country from making you know greater use of kinship and supporting children to grow up in their their wider family networks where that's where that's possible 
you're on you're on mute, Sal. Sorry. That's the most overused um, term now, isn't it? Um, um, so I think when you shift the mindset in terms of the approach that we're trying to take, I think if we start from the premise that uh, for most children trying to find, um, you know, where they can't remain with their parents, so all the effort should go into um, early help, support, trying to keep um, you know, children with their with their families. You know, when we've looked at um the the kind of situations that we come across um in Leeds we find that 10 percent is uh, 10 percent of the children are in those circumstances where there is willful deliberate harm towards them and 90 percent are families struggling in conditions of adversity we've got systems set up to deal with the uh, 10 percent that we apply right across the piece and actually it's that shift that we've that we've got to make i think in terms of saying um, where we know there's that willful, deliberate harm going on. We know what to do in those circumstances, how to make children safe. The next step then is where is the safety within that family and uh, community network? Where can we find uh, uh, that safety? And if we still can't, then you have the options of um, foster care and um, um, residential care where it's necessary for a short period of time. So the 90% um, is about how well we can engage how well we can help and support those families. Um, and even in those circumstances, uh, many children may not be able to remain um, with their uh, parents, but we should be putting all of our efforts into supporting those children to grow up in their uh, family and um, uh, in their community. And I, I don't think that that's the way that the uh, system is uh, set up and, and geared towards. And I think um, sometimes people um, feel like it is uh, much riskier um, uh, to work in that way and I think I'm um, trying to make but philosophically that's the direction of travel and then trying to make that you've got to in, it's almost like incentivizing that way of working um, so that when people are working and engaging with families and um, this is, we make it um, easier for them to work in this way rather than in the alternative because we yeah. believe for most kids that's the place for them to be. Yeah, absolutely and that that reflects a lot of some of the the themes that we picked up in the in the case for change and that we've been hearing from people in the review so far. Thanks, Sal. And then um, James and, and Janet, one of the things that both of you mentioned in different ways was about the potential to define kinship care um, more clearly and, and to have a, a form of support that comes with it that um, is more consistent and, and fair. Are there thoughts you've had about how that might happen without um, putting some of the features of a service around kinship that you know might risk it becoming a bit like foster care because i've having spoken to kinship carers we want to keep this as a, a family and feeling like a family um but how do you put the support around it that that maintains that and recognizes these as as families rather than as a service have you got thoughts on thoughts on that this is Charlie tobago james yeah um I think um, I think one of the things that uh, you were saying about uh, keeping it as a family um, rather than I mean I don't think foster care should be like foster care never mind kinship care should be like foster care but that's a personal view um, but um, I think one of the things is to um, sort out the mishmash of legal orders and give you know um, actual rights to children who are in being cared for financially and otherwise by somebody other than their birth parents um, and make sure that that, you know, is a criteria for getting the, you know, those um, benefits. And I think that the, that what kinship carers need is good assessment, but not assessment to, you know, exclude or criticise, but assessment that will actually um, ensure that their needs are met right from the start in terms of, financial support and I think because a lot of kinship carers are older I mean I'm raising my grandson on my pension I get no more well I get child benefit but as we all know that's very teensy these days um so we need to be able to you know ensure this financial support and we need to ensure that the support around you know aspects of the children's needs that that um, kinship carers may not be prepared for because so many of our children I think Lucy quoted 
um, you know, sort of uh, a statistic, which I can't remember, but, you know, so many of our children have additional needs of mental health and um, physical and learning issues that um, we, we may need additional support around those things, around things like maintaining healthy contact with um, other family, with birth parents. Um, and, you know, we should have the opportunity to have those things without, you know, sort of unnecessary surveillance um, around our parenting of the children. So, um, you know, focus on support rather than monitoring. I agree with that. I mean, to use a terrible word, I think process is terribly important. Um, and we've got to make sure that kinship cares are central to the process, whether the process is going on in local authorities or is going on in court. And certainly as far as court is concerned, uh, traditionally they have not been central to the process. They've been marginalised. They're not parties. They're often not there. And they're simply taken for granted. And uh, janitors rightly focused on the process of assessment. I mean, that, it seems to me, has got to be a two-way process. Now, obviously, part of it has got to be assessing whether the prospective kinship carer can actually cope, can, I mean, is actually suitable for the job. Um, but the other side of it is uh, the kinship, the prospective kinship care, being able to say to the local authority, if I'm to do this for the children, if the children to flourish under my care, then I need the following things. I mean, I don't have a bed for a child. My house isn't big enough uh, if I'm being asked suddenly to take on a kinship group. Um, if I'm being asked to take on very small children, um, I need things like buggies and high chairs and so on and so forth. Uh, and these things are terribly important, not merely in practical terms, but also in financial terms. Because something like Janet, who's just told us what her economic circumstances are, may simply not be in a position to provide those kinds of things, particularly if she's being asked to look after more than one child. Uh, and I think uh, if the case comes to court, in whatever context, it's vital that the kinship carer is in, in court in front of the judge, uh, not to be interrogated, but so the judge can well say, now, look, you've listened to what all these people are saying, you've heard what all the lawyers are saying, you've listened to all the social workers, what's your take on it? What do you, what do you want to tell me um, is important from your point of view in terms of this very important, very exciting, but very difficult journey you're embarking upon? And then the judge should be in a position to say, I mean, do you feel that you've been listened to uh, by the people who've been assessing you? Uh, have they got on board the things you need? Tell me, uh, tell me the judge, what are the things you need? Um, and uh, I think if the process was beefed up, in that, beefed up in that way, a lot of these problems would disappear because other judges may take different views on this. And I'm not for a moment suggesting in the, concept of kinship, in the context of kinship care, one should have, as it were, a formal care plan, like one has in a care case. But there's no reason in principle why uh, the judge should not, in the order, make clear uh, that in the court's view, what is needed, if this is to work, are the following things. Um, and if the order can say, um, the local authority, having considered the point, has agreed that uh, the uh, kinship carer will, within one month, receive this, this, and this, uh, whether it's practical support, whether it's emotional support, whether it's financial support, that will go a long way, I think, to uh, helping um, the kinship carers and through them, of course, helping the children. I mean, I've been to events, I've heard appalling stories um, of kinship carers who are themselves sleeping long-term on the sofa because we, society, the state, call it what you will, have not provided the extra bed. Uh, so the child is sleeping in the kinship care's bed. Well, I mean, that is a terrible indictment of our society, it seems to me. I mean, it's enormously credit worthy to the kinship carer who is heroically living in that kind of condition. But we ought to have a process which makes that impossible. So I know process is thought to be a bad thing. I'm not for a moment suggesting box ticking. Which, but a much more focused process, which enables kinship cares to have their say before they embark upon this terribly important 
and terribly exciting journey. Thank you, James. Thanks, Janet, as well. Um, Lucy, can I come to you now just to give us a sense of what people are asking questions about and making comments on? Sure. So there are lots of comments. I'm, I'm in the Q&A and the chat boxes because I think I'm, I mistakenly told people to go in both. Um, themes. As expected, there's a huge theme about financial support. So um, question from Rach asking, should there be a national non-means tested standard SGO allowance? Neil Stowe's asking whether local authorities should be required to publish their financial support that they offer for kinship carers. And Rian Bainan, interestingly, is asking whether the panel think there should be a shift um, from expecting local authorities to provide financial support to having a national benefit for everybody who's caring for someone else's child, which is something we're really interested in in kinship. Um, there's a big theme around resources and rights, and I've, I've put them together. So Paul Shuttleworth is, I think, expressing um, that while the Case for Change has said there's scope to increase kinship care, there's a feeling that this could be about reducing children in care to save money. How do we make sure that there is that shift in resources that Sal talked about um, and really reassure carers and those working with them that support will be prepared, uh, provided for the long term? And into that, I'm sort of pulling in what Janet was talking about around the lack of entitlement to support, and that's leaving carers vulnerable. Do we need rights for kinship carers and their children like children in care have? Um, there's another set of questions about support for birth parents. I think, again, picking up on what Janet talked about, how do we support that complexity of relationships and context? So Donna Lee and Maggie Jones have, have asked questions about that and made interesting comments. Really important point from Leon Klaus, who grew up in kinship care himself, and he's saying, how do we improve the way we involve people who've grown up in kinship care in the design of services? And then finally, there's a big uh, set of questions and comments about the postcode lottery that lots of, of the panelists have talked about. How do we get consistent support everywhere? And Rian Bainan asks, do we need a national strategy for kinship care? So, Thank you very much, Lucy. Great, um, great summary. I will try and um, reflect those back to the, the, the panel to have some discussion about and um, uh, uh, hopefully, um, hopefully have more comments come in from people um, as we do that, and I'll try, try and keep an eye on those as well. Um, so the, 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 this question around financial support, first of all, which a few people have asked about, um, what are your thoughts and ideas as panel members on on how to how to do that? Balancing, I guess, the the, the fact that there are lots of private arrangements um, amongst families who don't come anywhere near the children's social care system. Um, who um, who at the moment don't get any financial support for raising grandchildren or, or nieces or nephews um, with the, um, the the more formalized end of the system at the moment around special guardianship orders uh, and, and I think we're talking here about anywhere between 180,000 and 200,000 um, families so have you got thoughts or ideas um, on what financial support should look like Janet, do you want to? Yes, I mean, I, I sort of, I mean, I know that there's a lot of issues that would come out of this, but I tend towards, you know, a sort of entitlement to um, financial support. Whatever your financial situation is, if you take on extra child or children, um, it costs us, is it £56,000? That was the last statistic I saw, but it must have been about 10 years ago to raise a child. Um, you know, and for many of us who are grandparents, we don't have, um, you know, resources um, after a certain point in that to actually, you know, you know, earn more, for instance. You know, many of us will be retiring during the child's early childhood and many of us will already be retired. I mean, I had to retire early to have my grandson. I couldn't work full time and take care of him. So, yes, we should be entitled to, um, you know, sort of... Uh, an allowance on which to um, help, you know, raise the children. I, I mean, we've got to remember that these children will be in the care system, which is hugely expensive 
massively expensive if they weren't with us. And what we're going to cost for this is not going to cost anywhere near as much as that. Um, I think the second thing is, is that, um, you know, we need to uh, also be entitled to other things that um, have a financial implication. Um, for instance, you know, I mean, and um, some of you will hear me on this subject before, um, I think that any child who's had more than one carer in their early childhood, um, who has been moved from um, home to home, which many children have, the children in kinship care in my family have all had three sets of carers, um, should have access to therapy at the moment. Um, only children on SGOs through care proceedings have access to the adoption support, support fund, which pays for therapy. And the rest of us have to either try for CAM support, well, that varies as well enormously in terms of efficacy or availability. Certainly we haven't got either where I live. Um, so, you know, therapeutic intervention, otherwise that's an enormous cost for families. Um, and I think, you know, we, we need to keep looking at the hidden costs as well as the, you know, day to day um, raising the child's costs as well. We need to have, a, you know, consideration about, you know, what support children can get that would reduce costs to families, like the cost of therapy. Um, but Yes, I, I think I probably think that if it can be made to work, that a national nationally agreed allowance would be a positive thing. Great, thanks, Janet. And Sal and James, can you think of any unintended consequences of that, or or mm. any other points that you wanted to add to that idea? I think I mean I think the focus on there has to be a right here is important because uh, in times when money is short, resources are short, uh, those who have rights come out on top, and those who are merely entitled to ask for a discretionary dole tend not to. So I think the focus on rights is correct. Um, I think it's absolutely fundamental to get away from this idea that because a kinship carer is in some sense, is family, they um, are less entitled to public support than other kinds of carers. And I think I'm right in saying, for example, that a family foster carer is entitled to the same allowance as a non-family foster carer. So the idea that uh, the kinship carer, because they're kin, because they're kin uh, is less needy, less entitled, I think is fundamentally wrong. Um, and- um, James, can I just- The, fur the further point yeah. is, just one final point, the further point is, um, May, as Janet has hinted at, many of the children coming into kinship care have needs greater than other children. And therefore, um, one should not be just simply assumed, because this is a family arrangement, um, it's like any other family. It's a family arrangement in relation to children who have typically extra needs, special needs, additional needs. Um, and that has to be reflected in the resources. Whether the solution is um, a national, uh, benefit or local authorities, I'm not really competent to express a view. I mean, I can understand the attraction of a national benefit. On the other hand, when one reads in the newspapers anecdotally, when one reads court cases about the problems people have, ordinary, real people have, in extracting from the benefit system what they're entitled to, and the astonishingly high rate um, of defective decisions which are then cured in court. One has, I'm afraid, to be a bit sceptical about that. Thanks, James. I'm sorry, I can't you you about to ask. No, I was I was going to ask you particularly about the um, the the feature of the current system, which is um, family and friends um, foster care status, and whether that um, in the future is something we should you know the review should look at, um, given that it sort of it, you know often puts close relatives into the fostering system um, with all of the um, the uh, assessments that come with that. And we've spoken to foster carers who found that process, you know, completely inappropriate for- well, I can understand that. I mean, assessment is fundamental. You've got to make sure that the, kin the kinship care, the special guardian is an appropriate person. But one has to distinguish between kinship cares and kinship cares. Sometimes the kinship carer will be some aunt living on the other side of the world who's never even seen the child. 
sometimes the kin more typically the kinship carer is an uncle or, or an aunt or a grandparent who is already very familiar with the children. They may well, the children may well have stayed with them in their houses. A very different kind of assessment is required there. And I think the idea that uh, there's got to be an assessment um, of a sort of one size fits all uh, mm -hmm. is not appropriate. And I can well understand uh, family members, whether in a kinship care context, whether in a special guardianship context, whether in a foster context, being um, unhappy, upset or more. Uh, at what they may see as an invasive, inappropriate, unnecessary procedure, which they'd be prepared to accept if they were coming in as outsiders to an adoptive placement. But um, not all, many aunts and uncles and grandparents, after the parents, will know these children better than anybody else. Yeah. The idea that, um, putting it in a very tendentious way, um, somebody may come, up, come across as a young, inexperienced, pushy social worker, somehow knows better, um, is not the right way to start the relationship. It's not necessary, it's not appropriate, but one's got to tailor this whole process, as we've got to call them, says, one's got to tailor this whole process to the particular needs of the particular child in the context of the particular respective kinship care. Yeah, thanks James. I think in a way what we're describing here is a tension between uh, a right and an entitlement that might be national and consistent with also the need for stuff to be tailored, recognising, as James has just said, the the, the wide range of um, relationships that kinship carers may already have with with these children. Sal, do you want to come in on this and share some thoughts? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, um, I, you know, I think the idea of some sort of national um, entitlement, however, however it's done, um, it is probably the right way to go in the sense that you know, people are talking a lot about the fact that there's a massive postcode lottery. So if there was some something that was um, um, nationally set around this in, in, in terms of um, criteria and entitlement, that might create uh, some additional um, consistency. I think um, quite often when we've spoken to um, uh, kinship carers about um, their needs and um, experiences, Often it's not just about um, direct financial support. Um, actually, um, a, a lot of the time people are um, looking for help and support with uh, the circumstances they find themselves in, and particularly um, um, around um, therapeutic support. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot now about um, being trauma informed and um, understanding the needs, you know, understanding the impact as janet said of multiple placements for um, uh, uh, children and uh, the help they, that they need with that so i think there's something about still continuing to need to build the systems locally that uh, mean that um, people can tap into that um, to tap into that help and support on top of the financial um, 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 debate one of the things we're trying to do is to tr create uh, a continuum of support um, across the piece, because I think that um, this is it's not it shouldn't be necessary for there to be specific support for kinship carers for that to only kick in once you're into care proceedings or into having orders in place. Um, there should be support at an early help, family support level, um, and and that's that bit about the mindset shift really about how do we if we're really promoting children staying within their family and community networks, then we've got to provide support all the way um, um, across the whole system. I also think just because the issue came up, um, I um, agree with um, Sir James on the um, uh, issue around assessment, because um, quite often um, the assessment can get focused on ruling family members out <laughs> rather than focusing on their strengths and, you know, as I would say, uh, looking to the assessment should be about looking at what support or help would be needed in these circumstances for this child to remain within their family um, and, and it's a it's a different it needs a different approach really. we, sh we shouldn't really be assessing kinship carers um, in entirely the same way as we um, um, uh, assess um, foster carers who aren't uh, related to the family yeah can, can we talk a bit more? I think that's so, on a very important point there. I mean, if there were to be a national benefit, um, that could not be to the exclusion of the provision by local authorities of all the other services 
and inputs that are required. And I mean, if we went from the present system to a system where there was simply a national benefit, full stop, it would be immensely disadvantageous. I can see the attraction of a national benefit, but the uh, non-financial support, which Sal is focused on, and indeed the extra financial support that people may need in particular circumstances, if they need extend, you know, if they need a loft extension to, to accommodate the children, um, if they need very practical important things like bugs and high chairs, I think I don't think anybody would think that the appropriate place to get that um, is from the DWP. So um, if there's to be a national benefit, there has got to be, in my book, continuing provision by the local authorities, but as a matter of right, not as a matter of Dickensian holding out the begging bill, uh, please, Mr. Squares, can I have some more soup? Um, a right to these very important additional benefits, support services, as well as financial support. Thank you. I think um, that one of the things that I've heard from kinship carers in the last few months is the value of um, even knowing they're a kinship carer and being connected and supported with a peer group uh, of other kinship carers. And I know kinship have been doing lots of work and um, lots of work on that. So that really just underscores the support that's needed beyond um, just financial support. Um, on, on this- Well, that, that, is, that is what I might call the emotional support. And it's terribly, terribly important. I've been terribly impressed with the enormous benefit which kinship carers are obviously getting from being able to talk to other kinship carers in their own support groups. But there's also the support needed, the professional support needed uh, for damage, for therapy for damaged children, for example. Um, so yeah. support groups are vital, but they're not the complete solution. It, it, I guess it links to the, the, the issue of um, emotional support and also assessments. Can we spend a bit of time talking about the relationship between kinship carers and birth parents and the wider family network? And, have any of you got some really powerful examples of where that's been handled particularly well by a, by a local authority service stepping in to help build and um, uh, support those relationships in, in the most constructive way? Because that is, you know, extre an extremely difficult position, as Janet was saying at the beginning, that very often uh, grandparents get put in, but also birth parents who may, you know, we've spoken to birth parents who feel that part of their experience growing up um, uh, with their own parents wasn't great. And then to see that their own children then move to live with their grandparents um, is a really difficult um, situation to, to, to accept. So have you seen, you know, particular types of work or, or um, you know, stories where that's been handled particularly well? <laughs> there must be one. I mean, I, uh, if I can come in, I mean, I think that, um, one of the things that I would just, um, uh, say is that um, what, what um, you know, circumstances change, don't they, all of the time. And so you, you will be in certain um, situations where children can't be with their parents and um, alternative plans of whatever nature um, take place. But all the many years, circumstances of those parents um, do change and um, in the uh, kind of um, uh, traditional professionalized uh, approach to their to their care quite often those circumstances are not revisited um, but where you have kinship arrangements and quite often um, extensive um, arrangements for family time for um, children to continue to see their parents you might be able to manage um, and understand when those circumstances change and whether there is a uh, an opportunity then for those parents to have uh, an increased role in, in, in the care of their, their children or even some form of uh, rehabilitation. Um, but I think that um, this idea of um, um, bringing, the, bringing uh, that extended family together um, to discuss and um, uh, come up with what that plan looks like over a period of time and really strengthens the possibilities in that. So I think that, you know, we do, as I've said to you, we use um, family group conferencing quite extensively. And in these circumstances, you know, um, family, it's an opportunity for families to negotiate and plan about what those arrangements look like so that they've got a much stronger sense of um, uh, sustainability. And I guess then on the other side, um, where some of those 
um, opportunities for family time remain important but are difficult, then um, kinship carers should be supported with that. Um, you know, there should be support available to um, manage and oversee uh, those arrangements if, if, if necessary, because in some circumstances it is necessary to um, uh, manage that uh, effectively. Thanks, Sam. Janet just, McLean. Sorry. Um, can I just say, I think that um, the idea of family group conferencing early on in early sport before children start to move into, um, you know, the, the margins of going into care is a really good idea because it also means that, you know, family may be geared up better to uh, taking children because many of us take children at very short notice and um, then spend a lot, quite a lot of time just sort of getting our heads around that. Um, I think that um, also, you know, it may prevent children going to care as well. I'm, I'm a strong advocate of family group conferencing, but I also think that um, when, uh, you know, when there's support for, you know, sort of uh, birth contact, it must be something that um, actually, what a good model would be, would be something where um, the actual kinship carer is, stays in control of that, um, rather than it being something taken over by the local authority, um, which, which probably means we'll all end up in a contact centre at some point, which... Uh, in, is um, an undesirable outcome, as far as I'm concerned. But you know, to, but actually give us support to manage the emotional side, the practical side. Sometimes contact centres are needed. Sometimes there needs to be a, a, a barrier between the kinship carers and the and the um, and the actual birth parents. But sometimes there needs to be just some help for us to come to terms with our new roles with each other, um, especially when it's parents and their children. Who are on either side of this because you know when you you take your grandchild into your own care you change your relationship with your um children you, the birth parent um forever and i don't think that that is really very much acknowledged and i think it's really important to sort of help with um you know sort of interventions that help you know the birth parent and the and the kinship carers to come to a better relationship where that is possible. I do recognise the circumstances where the risks of the family from birth parents are, are too high, but, um, you know, it, it's got to be something that's judged on each case and not taken over by social services, not become another sort of task that they do. Thanks, Janet. That's really powerful. Um, James, is there anything you wanted to add on this? Well, I, again, I agree with everything Janet said. All I'd add is this. Um, again, it's a process point. Um, to what extent, I simply don't know the answer, perhaps I should, but I don't. To what extent are kinship cares at the outset um, either given guidance as to how to cope with these very difficult questions or at the very least told what to do, who to turn to if there becomes a problem? And I don't know, but I suspect, I hope I'm wrong, I suspect that when kinship cares run into these terribly difficult problems, uh, handling perhaps their drug, drug addict child um, who blames them, the grandparents, for having become an addict, um, I suspect that most of the help they get comes from support groups. Mm. Um, and we need to do better than that. I mean, support groups are absolutely invaluable. And those who've gone through the mill are in many ways the best people to give support, advice, encouragement, you know, put their arm around somebody's shoulder, as it were. Yeah. Um, but I suspect one of the problems is that many kinship cares, when they run into these problems, don't know where to turn to, uh, don't know where they can get help. Uh, and insofar as that's a criticism, it may be unjust, in which case I'll be told around, but insofar as that's a criticism, it's a criticism both of those authorities and of the court system, because these are things which, in my book, if the case has been in court at all, should be spelt out um, in the order, in the sort of mini care plan. Um, there are things which one can anticipate happening, um, and uh, kinship care should be prepared in advance, being, knowing what to do, at least who to turn to, if these things do happen. Yeah, I fear the processes aren't aren't adequate. And I think you know, on this point around support groups, 
And there's lots of areas where there aren't even any support groups. Um, mm. So it's a, it's a huge issue. And lots of comments coming into the, the chat at this point in time, echoing um, this discussion. Um, I'm picking up on a theme, actually, that the review is struggling to answer at the moment across a whole range of questions about how we both allow for services to respond to local need area by area and also address really unfair disparities across the system um, across the whole children's social care system including um, support for for kinship carers and, and how kinship is is used by is used by services um, th there were two questions which we haven't come around to but I think Lucy maybe you, you might have a, a couple of thoughts on them I think they're the most popular voted questions. One's from Elaine Farmer and the, the second one is from Neil Stowe. And they both relate to transparency of information um, from local authorities about what they offer. Um, have, have Kinship done work with particular local, local authorities on transparency of offer or how to share what they, what they do? Because they, they seem like quite important points. I think one of the things that works really well from our experience is having locally based independent workers. So we have uh, relationships with some local authorities who pay for project workers from kinship to be present in the, at very community level. And they're almost like the go between the kinship carers and the local authority so they can help seek out information, make sure people understand it, uh, refer to our advice service if people need clarification on anything. So I think there is there's something we shouldn't forget here that often kinship carers don't necessarily trust the local authority. Um, and there's a real, I think there is a real role for the voluntary sector here in uh, fos um, fostering really good relationships between kinship carers and local authorities. Um, and that's right from the beginning, you know, that really clear independent advice and information. I think there's a, there is a role for the voluntary sector there. I think that we must hold on to as much as, I would say to local authorities, the more you can share, the better, the more transparent the information, the easier it is for kinship carers to make informed decisions about their future and their children's futures. Yeah, thanks so much, Lucy. Um, and we're nearly at time. I wanted to say, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody who's asked questions and added comments from your own personal experiences into the, the discussion um, box there. A lot of these points echo messages we've heard now from hundreds of conversations and myself and the review team have had with kinship carers it is a real priority for the review so we'll keep having those conversations uh, working with organizations like kinship family rights group and others to try and find solutions um, as well as working uh, in depth with a number of local authorities in the coming months to try and find some different ways to improve the situation in the future so thank you very much to everybody who's attended and um, particular thanks to james janet and Sal um, for sharing their thoughts from very different perspectives um, uh, as part of the discussion. And um, a final thank you from me, um, my neighbour, um, our kinship carers, um, and I've been able to see um, since moving to the place that I now live over the last year, the just incredible, um, the, the incredible love and affection um, and work that those grandparents put into raising their grandson um, which is completely life-changing for, for, for their grandson. Um, and this is an area where I've probably learned the most since starting the review, just about the uh, exceptional commitment um, that uh, grandparents and aunts and uncles and other relatives have given to raising um, their kin, uh, which is um, joyous um, to see and hear about um, and is something that we as a society need to put our shoulder much closer to those kinship carers and, and help them out um, much more. So uh, on National Kinship Care Week, thank you to the kinship carers, particularly who've joined us uh, this morning, and I hope you have a good end to the week. Thanks very much. <laughs>